Hey everyone, welcome back to yet another episode of Coffee Time with Mr. Ying, with your host Mr. Ying. And today we're going to be talking about this new book that we just received. It's called AI Product Manager's Handbook. So first of all, I just want to start the video by saying apologize for the previous video on this book. And I've gotten some feedback that it's not really tied up to the chapters. So I thought to use this second opportunity to review some of the contents more tied up to the material of the book. So with that being said, let's get started. First off, let's start with the author and the contributor of this book, Irene Brasses. She's a director of digital product and data at the IWBI, or also short for International Well Building Institute. She has a degree in economics and a variety of different other degrees in the field of data science. And before she joined IWBI, she's actually been with Tesla, Gesture, as well as Beacon, all handling AI products. So not only is she a leading woman in data science, but also she contributed a lot in handling a variety of AI products from different fields in different companies. So Irene, thank you for providing the contents for this book. I truly appreciate it. Especially from my personal background, when I was going to school, I didn't really have the training to become an AI product manager. So when I came across this book, I thought it's great to have someone pack all that knowledge together down in this level of details, which I really appreciate. So there are three parts about this book. And before I dive into each one of them, I just want to say that on a high level, the biggest sensation I'm getting from this book is kind of in its title, right? The title says handbook. So you can kind of think of it as a reference book, a pocket book. And when you have a new jargon you don't understand in a company's meeting or whatever, you open this book, right? It's there for you. That's why it's called a handbook. So that's something interesting right off the bat. And I think that by itself lays the foundation of what I think this book brings on the table which is a dictionary, a portfolio of different names that may appear in an AI product manager's career. So that leads to part one. Part one is to give you a list of vocabularies in AI, in machine learning. Uh, for instance, we start with the basic terminologies, such as supervised learning, unsupervised learning, semi-supervised learning, and then even reinforcement learning, if you want to be a little bit fancy about it. So these terminologies are all there, and it's laid off immediately from chapter one. And the author is able to explain all these difficult terminologies using very simple language. So in other words, it's very interesting to start with a book with a list of vocabularies in data modeling, right? As an AI product manager, your job is to handle different parts of the AI product, which means you need to interact with data scientists, software engineers, people with those backgrounds. So you better get your terminology straight, right? What is database? What is data lake? And what can those things do? What is A-B test? You don't have to be an expert and develop all those things, but you need to be on board and know what these things are. And once you lay out the groundwork, you know the vocabulary, you know things on a first name basis. What's next is to develop the model and the AI product, right? So here, the book actually introduced this concept. And as a matter of fact, I've actually never heard of it before. It's called NPD, New Product Development. So what is NPD? It actually lays out a couple of important steps in a product development. So you start with step one, which is discovery of the model or product. You talk to your stakeholder, you talk to whoever owns the data or the executive sponsorship of whatever it is, whoever it is in your company, and you start with a problem statement. That will immediately lead to step two, which is to define what the problem is. Once you understand that the problem is this and this is the question need to be answered, you come up with a design. And the design is going to be very important because it targets on what goes inside of the back end of the user interface, right? Also short for UI. And as a matter of fact, based on everything I've seen, right? 
you should not start typing any single line of computer code until you have a system design diagram in your hand. You need to know what goes inside of the platform, uh, what's in the back end, what function need to be ran, and what buttons need to trigger what function. And then you can start thinking about how the API can be built up and how the API can be hooked up to the front end. So that when user press a button, that button triggers some functions. So that's step three, which relatively speaking is in the beginning of the pipeline. And then from here, this is when things get interesting, right? Uh, based on my experience, what comes after this is you train a model and then you launch it. And then you do your usual CICD, right? Continue integration, continue development. But what the author is actually writing a little bit differently here is to introduce this step five in the middle before you train your model, which is marketing. And specifically, if you read the book, it will say that marketing happens as a step, not just individually by itself in the middle, but throughout all these steps in the background. Now, that's interesting because that tells you as an AI product manager that it is your job to communicate with the clients, the customers, whoever it is that's using your AI product, the proper language that need to be used to make that communication happen, which I thought it's very interesting and very important step to do because based on everything I've seen, people tend to miss that part. And when I say people, myself is just as guilty as others because in my head, once you have a problem statement, let's look at the data, let's start building your machine, right? Why on earth do we need marketing in the middle as additional step? Me personally, I often sometimes miss that step as well, which now I read this book, it kind of reinforced a little bit saying, hey, look, that's an important step. Whatever it is you do, better communicate with the stakeholder. And then there's like a portion of the paragraph inside of this book that I found super helpful for me. He actually asked this question, when is a model ready for market? Now, that's actually a very difficult question to answer. And based on everything I've seen in my career, in my professional experience, that is a more of an ongoing question than a short answer question, right? The answer should not be, hey, tomorrow at 3 p.m., let's release the model, model's ready, right? It should not be as simple as that. Chances are it's an ongoing process. And throughout reading that portion of the book, I think the author's opinion kind of reinforced my experience a little bit because the author didn't really say, hey, you know, this is particularly the time that the model is ready, right? The author did not say that. What the author actually said was, it depends on hyperparameter tuning. Now that's an interesting approach because hyperparameters tuning uh, kind of imply that the model is complicated, right? Uh, if you have a linear regression model, obviously there isn't so much of a hyperparameter tuning to begin with. So let's take a neural network for example. The number of layers, that could be a tuning parameter. The number of units per layer, that could be another tuning parameter, right? Uh, if you choose an optimizer with a different learning rate, the learning rate can change. You change the learning rate, the algorithm is going to learn using different step size and that affects how algorithm converges, which could lead to a different performance or training path, which of course leads to different results. So all those things change, all those things need to be optimized. And now if you look at things from that perspective, you kind of, you know, indirectly answer the question yourself, right? When is the model ready for market? Well, it's a ongoing process and the continuation of a strategy that's being optimized out there depend on the model, depend on the parameters of the model. And when it comes to hyperparameters tuning, consistency is a key word, right? Whatever it is you're doing, whatever model that you're trying to push to market, make sure that you have a way of tracking the version of the model. Which version has what number of parameters in there and how that affects the performance. So that wraps up the part one, right? You have the vocabulary, you have the roadmap, you have the pipeline. You know what is the responsibility for product manager, right? That's building block. And then to take a step from that, part two talks about building a native AI product. 
which is something that's brand new in your company that perhaps people have never seen before. But that's not always the case, right? For some more sophisticated, larger size corporation, chances are there are some existing products out there within inside the company. So part three also talks about integrating a new product into an existing product. So obviously I can't cover every page of the book, but let me try my best to summarize part two and part three. Part two, you are kind of in the no man's land, right? You're entering into an area where no one has been there before, which means what? Which means as a product manager, you need to have your team, okay? You need to build up each role and what each role is doing. If data is dirty, then there's a guy on the team cleaning data. If you don't have a model, then there better be data scientists on the team building the model. Once data scientists build a model, you can't just stay the model on the shelf, right? It doesn't just live in a research paper. It doesn't just live in a PowerPoint to go on some Teams meetings, video calls, and so on and so forth, right? That model needs to go somewhere. So chances are you need to build a model, pack it up into some package, and you need to stand up that package with some API endpoint so that somewhere else in the company can call that package. So in addition to data scientists, of course, you have engineers. So you name it, right? Software engineers, ML engineers, DevOps team, those people need to exist. So as a AI product manager, of course, you need to know who these people are and you kind of need to be on board with what they're doing. If somewhere in the chain that's having a flaw or having a break, then of course this pipeline will crash. And it's important for a product manager to know how things work on a high level and who do you reach out to when part of this chain broke, right? So all that stuff is covering part two, which I really appreciate because me personally, if you look at my profile, I've been a data scientist and now I'm a senior data scientist slash machine learning engineer. So I've only been two of those roles, right? So this part two is also very important for my own career as well, because in the future, if I want to take a product to production, I better know what these people are doing, right? And then that's just the back end. Uh, we haven't even talked about the front end, right? What is the uh, UI team look like? Who is doing the front end dev? Who is making the website happen? Who is making the app happen so that the user can use it, click on the buttons, and then the button will show them a graph. So in addition to the back end, the front end, the UI UX team researchers, they're of course important to the whole corporation and you can't really just ignore these roles. And then in addition, what I really appreciate the content of this book is it actually goes into the customer service, product service, as well as know your numbers, right? Three keywords, very simple, know your numbers. As a product manager, you need to know who gets paid what, right? These are the things that you may or may not know from school and sometimes even from the industry, right? Because there are different rules, different policies within a company, and sometimes it might be sensitive to just share these numbers. So it's oftentimes not that transparent to know who gets paid what and what are the KPIs in terms of a dollar amount on the project. So this book actually talked about all of that in part two, which I really appreciate because that's something that I feel like I lack of knowledge to. And from my previous job, I barely know anything about any dollar amount. And in this job, I finally start to learn a little bit about what's going inside a product and what are the KPIs. And there are some estimates of the product of the KPIs, market values out there. So reading about this part of the book kind of reinforced that piece of experience that I'm having right now in my job. So that's definitely something interesting to share with all of you guys. So to wrap up this video, let me just talk a little bit about part three. Part three is about integrating new product into the existing product. So after reading all the chapters in part three, one thing that really caught my eye is fear, right? Fear is not the answer. That's literally the title of one of the portion of the chapters and specifically in chapter 11. So me personally definitely experienced some of that in my previous job. 
I remember one of the models, it's a little bit too advanced for the data that people are using. And a couple of the stakeholders on the team supporting that project were coming from non-technical background. So we actually got a little bit of pushback from me proposing to use a little bit complicated product. So to just be as clear as I possibly can to use layman's term, the original model on my previous team, the previous project I was talking about, used a logistic regression model. It gets the job done, it's just not that accurate. So I propose a neural network model. However, neural network model is determined by the number of layers, the number of units per layer, that sort of thing. And there isn't really strict scientific answer or explanation to say, hey, five layer neural network model is absolutely better than three layer, right? You don't really have that argument. The only thing you know is five layer has more parameters than a three layer neural network. That doesn't really mean it's better, right? So without that explanation, it's a little bit difficult to convince stakeholders what that model can do, right? Uh, simply because you have a higher accuracy doesn't really mean the model is better. So that was kind of like the story there and the lesson there that can be learned. And for me personally, that was a big lesson to be learned. So it's interesting to see that this book actually talked a little bit about that part. And specifically, uh, you want to compare um, what you gain and what you lose, right? If you're implementing a new product into an existing product, something's changing. So if something's changing, why don't we talk about the marginal cost and the marginal benefit? And that ought to give you some insight of how valuable the thing that you want to change is to the current project. And then one last terminology I want to throw at you guys that I found interesting is this thing called low hanging fruit, right? What are the quick wins? The kind of projects that you could turn around very fast, meaning that perhaps this is something that very common model out there can handle. And you have the data, you have the model, plug it in, get it deployed. Usually, uh, I found that in no man's land, low hanging fruits appear very often, right? Because you're in no man's land. You're in an area that no one has explored before. So there are bound to be higher number of projects out there in no man's land that perhaps you can just deploy your model and boom, you have your answer. So those are considered quick wins, right? Low hanging fruits. And when you are handling your product, uh, specifically uh, when you are one AI product manager handling uh, perhaps 20 to 30 projects, then in that case, one extremely important trait for the PM is to understand what can be considered as low hanging fruit. And then as a matter of fact, it's uh, not really a big leap to take a step further by saying that this concept of low hanging fruit is not binary, right? It's not like, hey, this project is low hanging fruit or not, right? You can kind of treat it as a spectrum. There's an extremely low hanging fruit, uh, something that you jump a little bit and then you can grab the fruit and a high hanging fruit, right? Perhaps there are different levels. It's not necessarily binary. So if that's the case, then I think that responsibility falls on the PM, the product manager, to recognize the opportunities out there. And I immediately tell the team, hey, look, you know, this is low hanging fruit, but if you jump a little bit higher, you can take this, which is a higher value, that sort of thing. And then you can have a conversation with data scientists, ML engineers, to talk to them, see what they think. So with that being said, hope you enjoyed the episode. And for all those authors out there, it's the same message for everyone, right? Uh, if there's a video that I created that perhaps doesn't really serve the best purpose for you, then please let me know. I'm very happy and honored to make another video for you guys for free because the whole purpose is to create an online community such that these knowledge can be widespread. And you guys are the authors, you guys spend all the energy efforts to create all these contents. You know, if I can be part of that, absolutely I will. So with that being said, if you like the channel, give a like and hit that subscribe button and I'll see you guys in the next episode.